We're going to keep going in the life of David tonight. As I mentioned a moment ago, this is our second to last lesson in the life of David. I hope you've been uh, encouraged and, and challenged by this series. I know that I've been, really enjoyed studying these things and, and sharing these things with you these past few weeks and, and, and doing it with Colby as well. Uh, tonight we're going to be in, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, if you want to go ahead and be turning there. 2 Samuel 11, we'll spend a little bit of time in chapter 12 as well. Get out your Bibles and turn there. And in a minute I'm going to ask you to allow me to uh, ask you to bear with my nerdy tendencies for just a moment. Someone here is probably thinking, yeah, we do that every week, Stephen. Uh, well, fair enough. Uh, but there's this really old poem that I love by George Herbert as a religious poet who uh, wrote poetry in the 1600s. So this poem kind of has that older, kind of harder to understand language to it. But if you get past that, the, the thing that it is saying, I think just goes so well with the story from the life of David uh, that we're going to see tonight. So I want to share a little bit of that poem with you. But before I do that, I want to talk about Red River, New Mexico. Anybody here ever been to Red River, New Mexico? Uh, my family would go there uh, once or twice or three times when I was growing up as a kid. Uh, uh, we went out to, to Red River. And, and the reason that we went to, to Red River, New Mexico, not only is it a beautiful place, is because at that time, and I think maybe still, they, they had this like week-long uh, Christian retreat encampment thing that they did at, at Red River, uh, and they had nightly singing, and they had nightly sermons, and in the morning you could go to Bible classes, and you could go there as a family, and, and you could breathe in the mountain air and just really be refreshed uh, and, and enjoy worshiping with other Christians and learning uh, along the way. And, and I know several of you raised your hands that you gone there, I know that firsthand because some of you, uh, I think, went with me. Uh, every now and then, we would have a small group from College Hill that would make the little trip up there and spend some time there at Red River. Uh, this is really, an, really a nice place. Uh, some of you may remember uh, football fans, uh, Longhorn fans, uh, may remember Colt McCoy. Y'all remember him? His family w would go there, and they had a uh, a singing group. They would sing old hymns and new hymns. It was really good. Uh, uh, funny, I don't remember seeing any Aggies quarterbacks there, just pointing that out. But really, the thing that I remember the most about Red River was spending time with my brother outdoors. I, I loved the, the time we spent in the, in the classes and in the, in the sermons, but, you know, it was, for, for a kid who grew up in the suburbs in, in North Texas, you know, being outside in the mountains was just so different. Uh, and one of the things I remember, one of the times we went there, we stayed in this little old A-frame house. Like, if you've ever wondered what it would be like to spend the night in a Whataburger, it was shaped exactly like that. You just needed some orange paint. Uh, but when you stayed in that house, you could go right out the back door, and before you could see it, you could hear it. Uh, the sound of the river. Just this rushing water uh, on the river. And my brother and I would love to go down to that river and we'd pick out stones and we'd skip those stones on the river. And when you really got down to the river, uh, even though it wasn't very big, that rushing sound was kind of a low roar. Like if you've ever stood by a river that's going kind of fast, it has a sound to it. This rushing roar as the water kind of pours over the, the stones that are down in the bottom of that river and it rushes by. And it's that sound right there. If you can picture that sound in your mind, that is what the poet I told you about, George Herbert, uses as an analogy for the way that God's grace sounds when it rushes against our sins. I want to read you just a line or two of this poem, and then in a second I'm going to put a key line up on the screen. So it starts by talking about sin, the, the poet's own sin. He says, I know it is my sin which locks thine eyes and binds thy hands, outcrying my requests, drowning my tears, or else the chillness of my faint demands. Yet hear, O God, 
only for his blood's sake, which pleads for me. For though sins plead too, yet like stones they make his blood's sweet current much more loud to be. Now I know that's not the way we talk these days, but let me put one of those lines up here on the screen and I'll show you what I mean. So the first part, he's talking about his sin and how it's just making a racket before God. His sins cry out before God, crying out to be heard. And yet he ends the poem by saying, Lord, what I really want you to hear from heaven, what I want you to hear is not my sins. I want you to hear Christ's blood speaking for me. And then he says, even though my sins plead and they cry out, They are like those stones in the river that when Christ's blood washes over it, they only make the sound of it louder. My sins, though they are not good, by Christ's blood, when it washes over my sins, it just goes to show and prove how great is God's roaring flood of mercy to me. That's what the poem is talking about. And when I think about that poem, I can't help but think about our story from David's life tonight. Tonight we're getting into a part of David's life that, you know, it really just has to be the lowest of the low for David. 2 Samuel chapter 11 is about as low as it gets for David. And, you know, it's kind of interesting to me because, you know, Colby and I have been working on this series for quite some time now. We, we started planning it back in August and really haven't changed it up along the way. And all that same time, I've been going through this long series in the Gospel of John as well. And, and it just so happened that this last Sunday, we were looking at another person who, like David, had just reached the lowest of the low in his life. And so uh, for me in my studies, it was like these two people that we love so much, both of them, Beloved figures in the Bible, both of them, ones that we know they love God and we look to them and we see and learn so much from their actions and their faith. And yet for both of them, on Sunday and then here tonight, it's just like all of the good things we've come to expect from them, they just veer off in another direction all of a sudden. And with Peter last week, we we saw him on Sunday deny his Lord at the moment that mattered the most. And now for David, we've come to expect so much character from him, so much integrity from him. We've marveled as he spared his enemies. We've marveled as he's taken care of the weak. We've marveled as he's chosen the right path over and over again. And then tonight, he just goes in the other direction. And it just starts snowballing and avalanching down this dark path. And, and, and we wonder, how did it get here? David is at his lowest of the low moment. And I thought about Peter when I was preparing this. Both of those stories have something in common. They have a common question. What are these guys going to do when they reach the lowest of the low? And maybe even more important than that, what is God going to do when he finds Peter, when he finds David, At their lowest point, what will God's grace do when it rushes against the heavy stones of sin that we find in their lives? Now, to me, there really is no question that 2 Samuel chapter 11 is the the low point for David. Because this is the story, if you haven't turned there already, I'll tell you. This is the story of David and Bathsheba. And even as I say those two names, for a lot of you, I know, you're starting to think about, okay, I know what happens here. It's a pretty familiar story. It's a fairly long story. I know a lot of you know it. So let me just remind you of the facts. Let me just remind you of the path that David goes down in this story. First of all, fact number one, David doesn't go to battle. First verse of 2 Samuel chapter 11 says, David did not go to battle at the time when kings go to battle. This is what it says. It was springtime, and it was the time when kings go to battle, but for some reason, David doesn't go. 
We don't know why. We just know that he doesn't go to war. And so as he's back home and everybody else is out at war, as he stayed behind, these are the facts, David saw a beautiful woman bathing who was not his wife, and he sent for her so that he could sleep with her. That woman's name was Bathsheba. And David, when he saw her on that day, apparently so consumed with passion, does something that we would not expect David to do. David, in this moment, when he sees her, he uses his power as king to get what he wants, doesn't he? And if that seems like the exact opposite of what you'd expect from David, it is. Because that's what we've been seeing all along. In fact, just last week, Colby was sharing with us the passage about David and Mephibosheth. Do you remember Mephibosheth, who was the relative of Saul, and and he was uh, one of the last remaining members of Saul's family, and Saul had been David's longtime enemy. Well, now David's king, Mephibosheth, he has two crippled legs, It would have been easy for David to use his power for evil and just end Saul's line right there. But instead, he sees his kingship as a gift. And so instead, he blesses Mephibosheth. He takes care of him. He invites him to his table. He cares for him in his moment of vulnerability and need. But now in this story, David does the polar opposite. He takes this power that he has as king and he really just kind of tramples on other people to get what he wants. So he takes Bathsheba and he calls her to him. That's what David does. And then the word comes. Bathsheba sends word and says, I'm pregnant. Now what's David going to do? He's made a bad decision. What is he going to do next? Well, the next thing, the next fact in the story is that David goes from bad to worse. And when he learns this thing about David, his, or about Bathsheba, his solution is to find her husband Uriah, who's out fighting the battle that David's not fighting, His solution is to find her husband Uriah and try to trick him so that his problem will go away. David's solution is to try and make it to where Uriah thinks this child is his and not David's. And so he takes him and he gives him wine and he tries to get him drunk. The only problem is Uriah says, I'm not going home. Uriah says, if the Ark of Israel is still in battle, and if my fellow soldiers are still in battle, then why should I go to the comforts of my home? Why should I go back and be at peace in my home? Why should I go home to my wife? Why should I be comfortable when everyone else is still in battle? So Uriah doesn't go. David's plan doesn't work. Okay, made a bad decision. Made a worse decision, tried to deceive Uriah. What's David going to do now? If you know the story, you know what he does next. David has Uriah killed. Yeah, he doesn't do it himself. But what he does do is he sends him out to the front of the battlefield and then draws everybody else back. May as well have done it himself. Uriah has no chance but perish on the battlefield. And that's exactly what he does. Just like that, we see this progression from bad decision to worse decision in David's life. And it started with this moment in his heart. And now suddenly it's leading to all of these actions that he's making that are affecting people's lives. It reminds me of the words that we read in James chapter 1 when it tells us that desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. There may not be a better commentary on 2 Samuel chapter 11 than that one right there. But you know, the story's even still not yet over. 
Next thing that happens, the prophet Nathan comes to David at the word of the Lord. And he tells David this story about this powerful, mighty man who had all the things he could ever want, and yet he chose to take his lowly neighbor and take the one thing that he loved from his lowly neighbor. And and David hears this story, and he gets so mad about it. He's enraged that someone would do that, and then it hits him like a stone. It was me. I'm the one who did this. And so the Lord says there will be consequences for what you have done. Therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me and taken the wife of Uriah to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house. And Colby's going to talk a little bit about that next week as we conclude our series. And then, of course, worst of all, Prophet Nathan says to him, that the child that is now born to you shall die. Which, of course, is what happens. The seventh fact of the story is that the child is born. And for seven days, David pleads and he mourns and he knows that he did wrong and he pleads and he grieves and he prays. But still, after seven days, the child dies. Those are the facts the facts of this story. And as you hear those things laid out one after another, there's really no question that this is the low point for David, not only for his character, but also just for his life story. I mean, the things that he has done have just snowballed down this path of of worse and worse choices. It started in his heart, but then soon it spread to his actions, and and now it's just leaving ruin everywhere in in his, his life. And, you know, this person that we rightly call a man after God's own heart, he breaks like three or four of the Ten Commandments in one chapter. Murder and adultery and covetousness and... And in a sense, bearing false testimony as he tries to deceive Uriah. All these things just have this devastating effect. David's at a low point. And yet, there's one more fact about this story that cannot be ignored or diminished or forgotten. The fact of this story is that even at this low moment, David's life with God goes on. It might have seemed like this was the the breaking point. But David's life with God goes on. His journey with God and God's relationship with him does not stop here in his lowest moment. And even though David has done some very bad things, the consequences of which he's going to have to live with, some of them for his entire life, even still, there is mercy for David. Because David's life with God is not defined by his best days or his worst days. David's life with God is defined by God's mercy and David's own repentant heart. And so David, when he heard that story told by Nathan, he came to a realization I have sinned before the Lord. And David prayed about that realization. He prayed with a repentant heart. He prays to God in Psalm 41, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. We believe that these words were written in response to the things that happened with Bathsheba. Wash me thoroughly, from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. 
For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you alone have I sinned, and have done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence, and blameless when you pass judgment, which God has done. So purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. You see, David on his worst day, in his lowest low, he repents and he prays to God with a humbled heart. And Nathan says to him, the Lord has put away your sin from you and you shall not die. Even after all that David has done, God was still able to wash him clean. In fact, a time is going to come when David will even cease his mourning about these things. He has grieved before God for his sin. He has grieved before God because of the consequences of his sin. But the thing we have to see is that he is not condemned to mourn forever in shame. Eventually, David is going to rise up from the ground, wash himself, anoint himself, change his clothes, and go to the house of the Lord and worship there. And then he's going to go home. And they're going to ask him if he wants some food, and he's going to sit down and eat at the table. God does not condemn him to mourn in shame forever because God has put away his sin from him. God has washed him thoroughly and God has made him clean. David's sin, like so many stones in a riverbed, cannot stop the flood of God's mercy from washing over him. David's sin, like stones in a riverbed, only makes the power of God's grace roar more loudly for anyone who would look and see. And I think that's not only true of David. I think that can be true of all people. Like David, we do not have to be defined by our best or our worst days. If we are a people with repentant hearts and willing to change lives, we can approach the flood of God's mercy, knowing that it is powerful enough to wash over us and change us, set us free. We can trust that our sins, no matter how heavy, cannot stand against his streams of mercy, never ceasing. And like David, when we have sinned, we may rightly grieve for what we've done and what it may have caused, the hurt it may cause, but we know that even that does not have to last forever because God can wash us clean. And and in fact, it shouldn't last forever. Because in the words of David, in the remainder of that same psalm where he prays for repentance, this is what he turns to say. After he prays for repentance and, and prays that he will be washed thoroughly, he says, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. David says, I've grieved before you, Lord, but when you have pardoned me, I'm not going to wallow here any longer. I'm going to demonstrate and proclaim what the Lord has done. Because God can use me on my best and my worst days. 
to make loud his river of grace. David's life, in a way, we could say, changes. From his repentance, which was necessary, to his mission, which is just as necessary. And now I can't help but think about Peter again, the one we started with on Sunday. In his life, he also reached the lowest of the low, and just like David, he had one of those moments where he had to come to terms with that, and and we saw the way on Sunday that standing by that charcoal fire, he found the mercy of Christ to be sufficient. He learned that God's grace was powerful enough to restore him to relationship with his Lord and Master. And when he learns that lesson, he makes this very same journey. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. I will lead sinners home to you. Acts chapter 2 is just one example of that, but it's the first one. So I think it's a really special one. You know, Jesus stands up, or Peter stands up in that passage, and he proclaims that Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested to you by God with his deeds of power and wonders and signs, that man you killed and crucified by the hands of those outside the law, but God raised him up, having freed him from death because it was impossible for him to be held in his power. And and don't forget that this is the same Peter proclaiming this, who just a little over a month ago had to come to terms with his own part in Christ's death. The fact that at that moment he denied his Lord at his moment of need. Peter also had to come to terms with this. And yet now, because he knows the mercy of Christ, he is now leading the way for others. And when Peter says to that crowd, repent, He knows what it's like to repent. And when Peter says to that crowd that your sins may be forgiven, like they really may, he knows that is true because he's experienced it himself. And his repentance turns to mission in his life of faith. Now he's been washed in the streams of mercy and now he's ready to lead others to that same spring of life. Maybe tonight this is a message that you need to hear. There's a lot of challenging things about this dark day in David's life. Maybe it teaches us the the power of unchecked desire that can give birth to sin. Uh, Something that we all deal with and and have to to work on. Uh, Maybe it's David's journey with God that he survived those dark days. And it didn't end there. But God's mercy was great enough to reach him and cover him and wash him thoroughly. Maybe that's what you need to hear. Maybe also what you need to hear is the challenge that when you know a hope like that, the the forgiveness that Christ can bring, not only does it set us free, but it also calls us out to do his work just as David has done, just as Peter has done. Maybe also we can do our part in his work to teach transgressors his ways and to help others to find those streams of mercy that so change us forever. However you may be called or challenged by this message, we'll give this moment to reflect and respond while we stand and sing.